Hi everybody, uh, welcome to an overview of the last chapter that we need for our unit on evolution. Um, up to now we have been studying in this unit basically we know evolution is change over time and we have seen many different ways that organisms change and the factors that affect that change and what are the forces basically that favor one type of change over another. Uh, today what we're going to try to do is uh, put all this together. We know also how based on the evidence that we have and molecular data and all the new technologies and supercomputer powers that we have now, we can try to put all this together and try to uh, build a tree of life and that's what we did before with all the cladograms and stuff. So now what we're going to try to do is uh, put this in a time frame and see how the sequence of events, what happened over time since the formation of Earth. So it might be useful if you can have with you, um, this is the chart that we have on our desks, it's a geologic time chart. Um, you have it in your textbook so it might be good to have it because that gives you a visual time frame of what we are talking about. It's kind of a nice timeline so you can put all these concepts in a specific place instead of just up there in empty space. So try to have that and as we talk about try to visualize the processes. This is kind of a nice storyline so hopefully it will help you understand what has happened on planet Earth in the last four billion years. Billion. A four with nine zeros there. All right, so <clears throat> this is a depiction of what it might have looked like. And as we will see later, these are some beautiful bacterial mats called stromatolites. So let's start. So we have, we know now that we have kind of a nice uh, evolutionary tree. And this is what I want you to have kind of handy with um, always through this um, unit or today's topic. Uh, have an idea of uh, the time frame when th things are happening. So let's just look at this. Earth actually, the formation of Earth is about 4.5 billion years ago or 4,500 million years ago. Um, so this is, now notice, time, 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 up to 500 million years. So for about 4,000 million years, very little happened. Very little happened in terms of action, as we will see. Most of the action, really, with a high diversity of organisms, started only in the 500 million years. So we're going to see how that happened and go step by step. First, since we're talking about life on Earth, let's see what, how can we define life. So basically, if you're going to have life, you have to have cells, basically a structure, an organized structure. And to be alive, you have to be able to respond to stimuli. You have to interact and respond to your environment. Uh, because of this, you have to be able always to maintain homeostasis, a happy environment inside. So it's kind of an interaction what's happening outside with maintaining your regulatory systems inside in check to be able to cope with the environment. And remember that's the whole process of homeostasis that a lot of it involves feedback inhibition until you're always kind of trying to maintain that steady line. Um, if you're alive you have to use energy otherwise you're not alive. Some type of energy so we all have metabolic pathways that process and use that energy. If you're alive, you have to grow and develop over time. And if you're alive, the only way to keep on going is that you have to reproduce, basically, so you can pass your information to the next generation. And that is done through our genetic material, mostly DNA and RNA. So we hope that you are all alive, because at the end of the process, through time, Basically, we are going to see that if you are alive, you have to adapt and you have to change because the environmental conditions are never the same. So check yourself, make sure you fulfill all this all the time because that means that you are alive. So, 
origin of life this is sometimes a controversial issue because we get kind of stuck between science and religion sometimes but you have to keep in mind that those two things are not different well they are two different domains religion deals with a set of beliefs that answers a lot of questions that we don't ans have answers for yet and gives us like a parameter to live you know a set of nice rules to live a good life science is just trying to explain what we see outside and that's it science is pure fact so those two domains we all have to have try to find a way to blend them and to meld them together so we can live a good life here. So, a hypothesis for the origin of life. Here we have the first one is special creation and that is the one that most religions advocate, you know, the basic of all the religions, uh, that life was created by a supernatural or divine force. The only problem, if we are doing science, we cannot test that. It's totally non-testable hypothesis, so we just need to live with and deal with it at a personal level. The other two hypotheses that are testable, um, some people have proposed an extraterrestrial origin for life, that in all these meteorites that come from space and crash on Earth, um, there actually are a number of compounds that are present in living things. So they think that a lot of the origin of life basically on Earth started with things coming from outer space in these meteorites. Um, they've been working on this uh, and every time they find a new meteorite, uh, they analyze it, they see the compounds. Eh. Is, is moving. Now, the one that is, has the most evidence, remember science is all about evidence, how much data you have for whatever, um, the, the one that we have the most evidence for is the spontaneous uh, abiotic origin of Earth, of life, and basically that life evolved spontaneously by the assembly of molecules on Earth. And it's testable because we can do experiments, we, tr we can try to replicate the conditions, we can try to do many things. So um, none of this has been totally verified, but the amount of evidence is building up. So first let's start with a quick view of what, was, what were the conditions on early Earth. So in early Earth, if you look at the atmosphere, what we had here, if you notice, check it out, we have water vapor, a lot of it, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, different nitric oxide compounds, hydrogen, ammonia, methane, hydrogen sulfide, a number of compounds. If you notice, there's a lot of hydrogen available, there are a lot of electrons available. However, if you notice what's missing there, there's something very important missing that we relish these days and that is oxygen. There was no free oxygen as oxygen gas. There was plenty of oxygen caught up in other compounds, but no oxygen gas in the original atmosphere. That's very interesting. And that's very good, actually, for the, for, um, the stability of organic molecules, because without oxygen, they don't oxidize, they don't break down. So any molecule that is formed because there is no oxygen, it remains as such. Low uh, uh, breakdown of these molecules. Now the energy sources that we had available at that time, pretty much the same thing that we have today. A lot of lightning, it was extremely unstable, a lot of water vapor, and you know what happens in our atmosphere when we have water vapor in the summers, it's one thunderstorm after another. So a lot of lightning, uh, a lot of ultraviolet radiation hitting the earth because there was no free oxygen. And if you don't have oxygen gas, you cannot have ozone. No oxygen gas, no ozone, and if you recall, ozone is O3, is in the upper atmosphere, and ozone is actually what stops ultraviolet radiation or reduces the amount of ultraviolet radiation hitting the Earth. So, no ozone in those days, so ultraviolet radiation was fairly high, a lot of energy, for better or worse. 
and also uh, the amount of volcanic activity was uh, extremely high because the, the earth was still kind of a hot ball and kind of coalesce and come together and it was cooling and you know what happens when hot things start to cool off a lot of energy being lost there so that those were the conditions not a very comfortable place not a place that you want to go on vacation now to try to replicate this and figure out what's happening first for this abiotic synthesis or abiotic origin of life uh, in the 20s, 1920s, a long time ago, Mr. Operin and Haldane, Russian and American, proposed, uh, they were chemists, biologists, and they proposed that for the first time that, yeah, we think based on all the geologic data and all the data that we have, that the atmosphere in those days was a reducing atmosphere. Lots of hydrogen, a lot of electrons, no oxygen. Later on, as more evidence came that in reality the atmosphere lacked oxygen but had all these other things. Um, in 1953, uh, Miller and Urey did a famous experiment in which they built an apparatus like this in their lab and they were going to try to test this hypothesis of um, the origin of organic molecules, basically, the first building block, without uh, the presence of oxygen. So they tried to replicate kind of the conditions in early Earth. And if you see here, they had a, a container with heated water. This was ocean kind of water and constantly heating it, simulating the, um, the conditions in that time. The system was closed. And here the, they had gases. And the type of gases that they put there was a mixture of gases very similar to what had been proposed. Uh, was present in the early atmosphere. And then they have some inlets and outlets so that they could take samples and analyze those samples. Uh, on top of that, right here, they have a couple of electrodes that they were basically discharging, simulating um, lightning. So hot stuff and a lot of lightning going on there. So basically a closed circuit, just like the primitive Earth. Now. Please notice this is 1953. Uh, we don't know yet the structure of DNA. Our analytical chemistry was good, but never as good as today. We didn't have the kind of equipment we have today to analyze compounds, molecules. So what was the result of this experiment? After putting these gases there, the water boiling, they let it run for some time. When they pour some water to analyze what was in this water, they found a number of amino acids and they found at least adenine and they found a few other things but these are the two most amazing ones they've made amino acids and adenine and as you know nucleic acids and proteins are made with those molecules so it was quite a interesting discovery that was 1953 and that got a lot of people thinking about this here you have a view, this is a view of the lab. They worked at the University of Chicago, actually. And they have, that's the lab that they have set up. And these are the balls with the uh, lightning. In addition to those amino acids, they also produce hydrocarbons. Now, why am I adding other things? Because uh, just a couple of years ago, they were doing some renovations in the University of Chicago, in the labs where these two people worked, and they found their original vials where they had kept their samples from 1953. And what they did is they found those that were stashed in some cabinet, and they reanalyzed them using all the modern te techniques that we have. And what they found was like, whoa, there is a lot more than what they thought they had. So they had uh, many more amino acids. They had also hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are long molecules of carbon all joined together, pretty much very similar to fatty acids. That's a hydrocarbon, carbon with hydrogens attached. Same thing as a fatty acid. The, besides adenine, they found some other of the nitrogen bases and they found some other organic compounds. Remember, an organic compound is anything made with carbon and hydrogen. So it was like, whoa, 
they really found or they really were able to produce a lot of things. So pretty interesting that they found those vials and they were able to reanalyze them and get even more stuff that they had. So that was Miller and Yuri. So based on that, you can figure out the easy steps. Remember, this is all tried to repeat in the labs. Uh, they have been trying to make a cell from scratch, actually. So the, if you want to make a cell from scratch, the steps are, in theory, fairly simple. First, you have to have the abiotic synthesis, abiotic basically, without leaving things around, of small organic molecules. So you have the inorganic compounds and with enough energy, some organic compounds have to be available. You have to have amino acids, you have to have um, nucleic acids, those kind of things. So that apparently, based on the miller urey experiment, is perfectly feasible. Now the idea is that when you have these amino acids, these amino acids actually are able to join together to make um, small little polypeptides and actually if you have these amino acids and you put them someplace in some hot sun or hot clay they actually polymerize together making polypeptides same thing with many of the other compounds so they are made in the water but if they are sitting in a pool of water that is drying up and happens to be at hot clay they will polymerize and make bigger molecules so all this has been done and tested in the lab so you have the polymers there and now the catch is, well, let's put them together in an enclosed compartment. Now in the lab, you can actually do this. You can grab a bottle, you can grab a bottle and put a mix of carbohydrates, a small polypeptides and put something like hydrocarbons, you know, something oily. If you shake it up and you let it sit, what you're going to see is that you are going to form these funny looking structures. Basically, it's a layer of oil, lipid, and inside is going to be trapped a few of those organic molecules. Now, this is just done in the lab, and you can do this. A layer of oil, a bubble of oil, and inside the bubble of oil, you have um, organic compounds trapped. Now this is pretty amazing because if you have organic compound, compounds trapped inside something, guess what these organic compounds might do? They might react with each other. So this is what they call protobionts, the protobionts, basically primitive, not even cells because they are not self-replicating, they are not alive, but these structures do exist and do form and you can make them in the lab. So it is thought that this was kind of the first step towards building the first cell. Now the really big step is really the origin of cell replicating molecules. You can build one of these, but the idea is that this thing has to replicate itself and be able to pass the, some kind of information to the next level. And if we are going to talk about uh, self-replicating molecules, uh, here is what we think was the first genetic material. It is thought that the first genetic material was not DNA, like what we see today. Remember, DNA is double-stranded, it's very complex, but if you think about other genetic materials, we also have messenger RNA, or any RNA, and RNAs are single-stranded. Now, it is thought that RNA is actually the first original genetic material that these primitive cells might have had. And the reasons for that are right here. First, RNA is simpler because it's simp single-stranded. It's a self-replicating molecule. It can copy itself. Remember that if it falls on each other, they can hydrogen bond, they can break apart. Think of a small interfering RNA kind of thing. So they, uh, they can actually copy each other. They can be small, but small is good. It's a beginning. The other significant thing about why RNA might be the first nucleic acid or nucleic genetic material is because RNA works as a catalyst. 
Remember we mentioned that we have our RNA in our ribosomes and you don't use any other enzymes to build your proteins because RNA is a catalyst by itself. Think also of the spliceosomes, putting together introns and exons, the whole thing. Same process, you don't use any other enzymes because our RNA, uh, RNA in itself is a catalytic molecule. So, and remember, if it's RNA, we call those catalytic molecules ribozymes. If they are proteins, we call them enzymes. So, to make a long story short, we think that RNA is the first um, generic material, ge the molecule, because it, it is self-replicating, is relatively simple, and has mostly catalytic properties, so it can act as a catalyst. kind of a quick overview of what we think, how things happen at the beginning. A lot of research is going on on those topics right now. So um, now we are going to start putting time dates and see what happens. So just a quick review. Remember that to figure out the time when things happen, we need to know the age of the rocks or the fossils. And for that, we use what we call relative dating with the help of index fossils like the trilobite that you have here, remember that? Uh, and if not, we use absolute dating when we actually look at the um, rate of decay of uh, particular um, atoms. And remember, we do not use... Um, we do not use carbon because carbon-14 has a relatively very low half-life of only about 6,000 years. So that only takes us back down to about 60,000 years of useful data. So be careful with carbon-14, it's only for fairly recent events. Pretty much human history is um, studied using carbon-14. For rocks and fossils, and to go back to the four and a half billion years of planet Earth, the most common one is potassium-14. Please become familiar with this diagram. Take a minute to really look at it, study it, and digest it. I have it throughout the rest of the uh, presentation here. It's like a clock, and the clock starts backwards, 1 billion years, 2 billion years, 3, 4, 4.5 to 5 billion years. That is the Earth of planet Earth and our solar system. All right, so here would be the solar system beginning. Here is really when origin of planet Earth, when Earth started all the gases and elements started coming together. If you notice, you move, 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 what's the first thing that happens here? In yellow here, you have, this is when we have uh, prokaryotes on Earth. And the only way we know that is because that's when we have um, fossils of prokaryotes. If you keep on going, so prokaryotes evolved around 3.8 billion years ago, three and a half. That's when we find the first fossils of prokaryotes. If you keep on going, then around here, 2.7 or so, that's when we start seeing oxygen on Earth. And if you are seeing oxygen, that oxygen is made by photosynthetic organisms. And since all the creatures so far are only prokaryotes, those photosynthetic organisms have to be blue-green algae, that's the bad name, better known as cyanobacteria. If you keep on going, what happens around 2 billion years ago? Here we have the first fossils of eukaryotic type of cells with real membranes inside. Membranes forming compartments. Because these guys have membranes, lots of membranes inside, as I have shown you before. But now the membranes are forming nice compartments right here. Looky, looky, keep on looking. We have about from 2 billion to one and a half billion, now we start seeing multicellular. So they are aggregating the cells and forming multicellular structures. Notice we go from one and a half billion years to just 
half a billion years. So for one billion years, a one with nine zeros, there were multicellular eukaryotes, just masses of cells kind of not very well assembled. One billion years of that. And then all of a sudden, here we are in five, hundred million years ago, the beginning of the Cambrian period, when we have all the sudden diversification of animals, plants, and everything just explodes in terms of diversity very fast, until we get here, and in this big picture, here is where we are. That little dot there, that's humans. So we are just been here for like a second in the big picture of Earth. So, life really originated about 3.5 billion years ago. That's the evidence that we have. And at that time, remember, no oxygen on Earth. So what's the only way that these prokaryotic organisms can get any energy? The only way that they can do it is through glycolysis. Now, if you look at this, this is actually a picture of a fossil. Where am I? Right here. It's a 3.5 billion year old fossil of bacteria. So first we have to find those old rocks, and then they slice them thin, 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 and they put them under the microscope. And that's kind of what they look like. And you say, oh, that doesn't look like anything. Well, here are some pictures, actually, of living bacteria these are obviously like a, a string of bacteria all together. And here we have some that we find today. So what we are seeing is that a lot of the stuff that was there, we have very similar things still today. Bacteria haven't changed much, some of them, over time. Or they have changed, but the simplicity of the structure is still there. So prokaryotes. 3.5 to 2 billion years ago, all this process here. Remember, no oxygen, so all these have to use the basic metabolic pathway that we still have today, which is glycolysis. Remember glycolysis, you start with a molecule of glucose, and through a number of reactions, you end up with two molecules of pyruvate. And that process does not need oxygen at all. So please keep that in mind. And if you think about it, this was the first metabolic pathway to produce energy and is the one that everybody uses today. Every single living cell uses glycolysis up to this day. So again, it's one of those evolutionary funny things that, hey, we all have the same process in common and that means that we all have the same enzymes to do this process. We all share those genes from the lowly bacteria to us. Now remember that at the end of glycolysis you have the two pyruvates and you have produced NADH and you have to unload those hydrogens somehow and that's what we do through the different types of fermentation, alcoholic and lactic. So after that they had to find a way somehow to unload those um, hydrogens. So there was some type of fermentation going on after completing glycolysis. No oxygen, so no need to go anywhere else. Now remember, glycolysis produces only two ATPs. So it's a very low energy process, and when organisms have low energy, life is very slow. So keep that in mind. 3.8 billion, or 3.5 billion, you know, couple, half a billion years doesn't matter much in the big scale of things, until about two billion years, for more than one billion years, this was life. Remember that with low ATPs, life is slow. What sort of evidence do we have that these things existed? And, well, the evidence is mostly comes from this uh, match of bacteria called stromatolites. And here is a rock cut up, and all these are layers, mats of bacteria. You know, it's like the bacteria in your teeth that makes nice films, and the less you brush your teeth, the thicker that film of bacteria gets in your teeth. It's the same in the ocean. And these are oceanic things, and they make mats, 
and another layer of bacteria and another layer of bacteria and here is uh, let me introduce you to Lynn Margulis they are collecting these bacteria mats today in our day you still have them and you have seen this in lakes and some parts of the ocean they just make these thick mats of uh, bacteria we, you think you call them algae sometimes but they are just layers and layers of bacteria beautiful so keep an eye on Mrs. Lynn Margulis so these fossils that we find you can still f see them today happening the same very similar types of bacteria now when these layers accumulate 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 they form these kind of funny things that look like nice rocks these are actually stromatolites basically multiple layers of these bacteria that keep on growing over millions of years and there is a place on earth Australia has many of these stromatolites and you can go there now some they are under the water and to study them you have to go underwater and saw them and take them to the lab and then slice them so bacteria prokaryotes colonize the earth and were the only uh, organisms on earth for more than a billion years now what happened around 2 million, 2 million, 2 billion years ago? Right here. 2.5, 2.5 billion years ago. 2.7 billion years ago. What happens then is that we start seeing the presence of oxygen in the atmosphere. And how do we know that there was oxygen in the atmosphere? Because if you look at uh, rocks, you start seeing lines that are red and when you have this when you analyze this you realize that this is um, iron oxide iron rust rust and when iron rusts it only rusts in the presence of oxygen and rust is kind of that reddish color so before this time iron was kind of the regular iron color kind of blackish and then from this time on all the iron that we find in the rocks is kind of reddish that tells you that there was oxygen now oxygen gas available to react with the iron and form iron oxide or rust so now the question is who was making this oxygen because had to come from some place remember we have plenty of oxygen but it's caught up in molecules so now the somebody has to be releasing it as gas and those creatures that are doing that are photosynthetic bacteria that we call blue-green algae or cyanobacteria these are the creatures that start producing oxygen and all the oxygen that you are breathing today all the oxygen that we have today comes from photosynthesis that's the most amazing thing the oxygen that we have today comes all from photosynthesis so once we had a photosynthetic bacteria they start releasing oxygen and the amount of oxygen starts increasing in the atmosphere so now we have first bacteria that couldn't do photosynthesis then obviously we have bacteria that could do photosynthesis that means that they had some type of photosynthetic pigment in their membranes uh, so we are kind of getting ready we have been doing this for uh, a billion or almost two billion years and we know that we are getting closer to the eukaryotic cells so where do the first truly eukaryotic cells come from we find fossils of the first eukaryotic cells about 2 billion years ago I always remember 3.8 is the first prokaryotes and about 2 billion years later almost uh, you get the first eukaryotic cells and in the meantime in the process you start seeing an increase in the amount of oxygen on earth now where do eukaryotic cells come from so if we start with a prokaryotic cell 
and I have already shown you that prokaryotic cells have just the membrane outside but they also have a lot of internal membranes where they're processing, doing, um, they just have the membranes and we still have mem uh, this type of bacteria today. We can do electron micrograph of them and we can see. Now if you think of the process and we see that today too, if you go out there and look at bacteria inside, there are different levels of membranes inside. Some have very few, some have eh, in between, and some are loaded with membranes. So we see this diversity in membranes in present day bacteria. So if we use the clues from today for the past, you can see that the increase in membranes is a thing that has been happening and there were individuals with more or less membranes. What's the advantage of a membrane? Increase the surface area, more areas for uh, reactions to occur, and it can start providing kind of a separation of environments inside the cell, compartmentalization. And each little environment can have slightly different conditions so you can do different processes at the same time. So if the number of membranes start increasing, you can see how this happens. And the membranes come basically is kind of from the outside membrane, just kind of goes in and folds. If this process continues, you can kind of see what might happen, that the genetic material starts getting kind of surrounded by all these membranous structures around them, until it gets so surrounded that it can actually form a distinct nucleus. So the first kind of organelles that we have there is probably the presence of a semi-nuclear area because the genetic material got encased. And what does this look like? This looks like ER. So that's what we think happened first based on the evidence that we have from present day bacteria that have this diversity. So in foldings of the plasma membrane, prokaryotic ancestor until we get to a more evolved cells with more membranes and that would make the nuclear envelope and the endoplasmic reticulum some of the first organelles or separate compartments that we have. Now remember that they had their own ribosomes. Ribosomes are always there. So, if you have this kind of situation, you can specialize, increase surface area, and that is gonna increase the efficiency, and if we throw in natural selection, the ones that do better survive, the ones that don't do better do not survive. So obviously, this had a slight advantage over those, and this kept on being selected and keep on changing. Now, what happens next? So we have this primitive eukaryotic cell just with um, endoplasmic reticulum and nucleus. Probably the only type of a metabolic process there is still glycolysis, anaerobic respiration. And to get energy, obviously, they have to consume other organisms by phagocytosis or just engulfing uh, small organic molecules that they can break down. So we are here now, we have prokaryotes, oxygen generated by photosynthesis, and now we start seeing around two billion years ago the single cell eukaryotes. So what's happening to these eukaryotes in this, the next two billion years? It's a long time. Well, from this simple cell, picture this. This is a free-living bacteria that can do aerobic respiration. That can do aerobic respiration, can use oxygen. There are some of those, and we still have them today. <laughs> aerobic respiration. Now, the big fish always eats the little fish, engulfing that small bacteria. And if that bacteria never gets digested, really, it forms a nice symbiotic relationship because this bacteria can do um, aerobic respiration, provide this cell with a truckload of ATP, 38 molecules. And in return, what does the bacteria get here? 
it gets a nice cozy environment, protection. Protection from predators, predator, uh, protection from UV light, protection from unstable environmental conditions outside. So this is basically a great relationship, symbiotic relationship, and this is basically the origin of your mitochondria. Was an aerobic, aerobic bacteria that was engulfed, and it was a mutually beneficial relationship that has survived through natural selection. So this is the origin of an aerobic eukaryotic cell. Now, what happens with plant cells? What do they have in addition to this? Think of a plant cell or a eukaryotic cell that does photosynthesis. Think of protista that do photosynthesis. They have all this. But in addition to this, what do they have? They have chloroplast. Now, where do chloroplast come from? Well, the same process. Remember that the first oxygen came from photosynthetic bacteria. So we know those have been around forever. So here you have, if you follow this process, this is just your regular aerobic cell now. But if this cell engulfs and eats, tries to phagocytize, phagocytize a photosynthetic bacteria, what happens next? You have a nice mutualistic relationship here where this bacteria can now use sunlight to produce organic molecules and is protected. And on top of that, this is going to need CO2, which is being produced by this one. This one needs oxygen that is being produced with this one. Strong selective force there because it's a very beneficial system there. So this is what we call the endosymbiotic theory for the origin or, yeah, of eukaryotic cells. Make sense? So eukaryotic cells. First, we see an increase in membranes, formation of a nucleus, formation of an endoplasmic reticulum, and the most important organelles that we have, chloroplast and mitochondria, are the result of endosymbiosis of free-living bacteria. Now, you say, oh yeah, this is a lot of speculation. Well, not really, because the evidence is just overwhelming. This theory was first proposed by Lynn Margulis. This is the lady at the beach collecting stromatolites and looking at those things. Now, she just passed away about two or three years ago. What's the evidence that we have that these mitochondria and chloroplasts were really free-living bacteria before they became symbiotic organisms? Well, mitochondria and chloroplasts resembled a structure of bacteria. If you look at them, they have the membrane, internal membranes, just ribosomes inside. If you look at the ribosomes on chloroplasts and mitochondria, they have the same structure as the ribosomes of bacteria. Remember that the subunits of eukaryotic ribosomes and the subunits of the ribosomes in bacteria are slightly different in size. Guess what? The ribosomes of chloroplast and mitochondria, the subunits are just like the, sub the subunits in bacteria. In addition to that, just to show you how similar they are, they are also those ribosomes sensitive with antibiotics. Our ribosomes, eukaryotic ribosomes, when you take antibiotics, some antibiotics target the ribosomes. Our ribosomes don't, don't blink, don't, don't get affected by these antibiotics. But these, the ribosomes of your mitochondria do get affected by some of the antibiotics that you take. That's why sometimes you feel like kind of uh, slow and draggy because your mitochondria are being affected by the antibiotics you take. What else? Well, remember that mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own circular DNA that does not have histones just like bacteria. So, presence of ribosomes that look like bacteria, presence of DNA without histones just like bacteria. Mitochondria and chloroplasts are very creepy because they are able to move freely inside your cells and do whatever they want to. They are not under the total control of your cell. 
they kind of do their own thing, including independently reproduce from the cell. They reproduce whenever they need to reproduce to fulfill their functions, and they do so by binary fission, just like bacteria. So it's like having a living thing inside a living thing, a very creepy feeling, but a very good relationship. Uh, on top of that, let me add one more that I didn't add here. If you compare the sizes of your chloroplast and mitochondria, the sizes are just like the sizes of the typical bacteria cell. So evidence, if this doesn't convince you that our mitochondria and chloroplast were free living bacteria at some point, I don't know what else we need. It's truly amazing. So now we have a true eukaryotic cell with capacity to um, increase the amount of energy produced because now we have aerobic cells. We also have these cells that can use sunlight so they are more independent, they don't need to be eating stuff around. So the next step actually, and we see that, is in the fossil record. First we have these individual cells. Now we start finding fossils of agglomerations of cells. It's not really an organism, it's more like a colony. So they start aggregating, and what's the benefit of becoming aggregated, of forming colonies? The most primitive colonies, and we still have those kind of colonies today among the protists, every cell is still kind of independent of each other, and every cell does its own thing, great, and it's good. But the benefit of that is that safety numbers. If you have a predator here, choo-choo-choo-choo-choo, eating around, safety numbers, that means at least the ones on the inside are going to be protected. So the first type of colonies were just equal division of labor, I mean everybody is totally independent. The next step in evolution, we start seeing these colonies, but it, they show the cells start showing evidence of differentiation, that some cells are doing some kind of jobs and some other cells are doing other kind of jobs. So specialized for different functions, that's the next step in evolution, increasing the complexity. If you have many people, division of la labor is the normal path. Wow, so we had hit all this major, a lot of information here, I'm totally aware, but notice we started here with the formation of our solar system, uh, origin of Earth, four and a half millions, then we have our prokaryotes, then we have prokaryotes that produce oxygen, right here. Now we start seeing eukaryotic cells, and we have nucleus, ER, and then we add mitochondria and chloroplast. And notice that then we start having multicellular eukaryotic organisms, organization, but notice that these multicellular were very just multicellular, not very defined structures for a long time, until about half a billion years ago, or about 500 millions. So from now on, I will start talking in millions. 543 million years ago started a period that we call the Cambrian Explosion. Boom! It's not an explosion, is an explosion of diversity, adaptive radiation kind of thing. Major explosion in the amount of species, high diversification of species, all of the sudden, in a very short time, we find animals, of a, well, a short time in geologic time, you know, 40, 50 million years old. Great diversification of animals, and if I show you this right here, check this out. So here in, we're in 543, here is what we call the beginning of the Cambrian period and the Cambrian explosion. Before this, the only creatures that we find are um, fossils of sponges and cnidarians, jellyfish, those kind of things, that are the first groups of animals. And then all of a sudden, notice between 540, right here, and 510, 30 million years, notice what happened. Pretty much we have evidence of every major group of animals. We have echinoderms, starfish, all the chordates, fishy looking things, brachiopods that look like clams, annelids, all the worms in the ocean, mollusks, 
all the good stuff we eat, and arthropods. They all kind of, within 30 million years, they all appear in our fossil record. Why do you think that we have this huge explosion in diversity in such a, in such a short time? Remember, it's all relative. This is kind of a, the image of what the ocean might have looked like in those days. A lot of sponge looking things, primitive worms here, kind of a arthropods, more like trilobites looking things. A lot of diversity, this is a very cool world that they had going on there. If you look at life through time, it's a cool graph too. Notice here we have extinction rate, death. Notice that the scales are different though, please. Extinction rates, and it's gonna be illustrated by the blue line, a number of families in terms of, you know, genus, family, order, number of families, special groups of organisms. Diversity, here is the Cambrian explosion from the pre very fast increase. Then you have a decline because you have an extinction period there. And then slowly you see these crashes, but up, another crash, up, up. And up to now we have an increase, a significant increase in diversity. Notice that through time we have periods of major extinctions we have a couple that were significant between the Permian and Triassic here. Look at this boundary. We have a really what we call a mass extinction, major event. This was caused by uh, volcanic activity, mainly in, they believe now it's in the Russian shield. Uh, so much uh, volcanic activity there that changed the composition of the atmosphere. And then we have this Cretaceous max extinction that is the border between the Cretaceous and the Tertiary here. This is 65 million years ago. This is what got rid of the dinosaurs, but allowed mammals to evolve. So significant processes there. What's the deal with the Cretaceous extinction? Cretaceous extinction, here we have that's the one that happened 65 million years ago. In this extinction, we have an asteroid that landed, it was about 20 miles in diameter, landed right here in the Yucatan Pe Peninsula, and we have been able to see the crater now using imaging technology from satellites, and the conditions change so drastically at this point that basically changed conditions on Earth. The idea is that the impact was so big that created a huge plume of dust and other things into the atmosphere that basically reduced the amount of light significantly. Without light, what happens without light? Plants die, and all those creatures that eat a lot of plants die, and then the ones that eat those die. And if you think of a dinosaur, the size of the dinosaurs, such a big humongous animals that pretty much they have to eat a tree a day to survive. Basically their energy needs were so high that they couldn't make it given the increase in, the decrease in photosynthesis. Uh, why do we know that this is really what happened? Because if you go to rocks in the 65 million year ago border where, when this happened, you're gonna find a thin layer of iridium. Iridium, 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 iridium. This is a element that is pretty rare on Earth, but it apparently was very abundant in this asteroid. And when the asteroid pulverized, all that iridium went into the atmosphere. And so wherever you go on Earth now, you find this thin layer of iridium all over in rocks that are in the 65 million year old boundary. So asteroid disintegrates, iridium goes into the atmosphere, shh, settles down, leaves this nice layer all around, and after that we don't find any more dinosaurs around. No more fossils, totally disappear. This 
this, this, this. Thanks to this, to the disappearing of the dinosaurs, is what allowed basically the explosion in diversity of mammals. You know, everything has good and bad. If you look at this diagram here, Jurassic Cretaceous Tertiary, that was called Jurassic Park, the movie. These are, the, the shows the diversity, number of species, kind of, of these groups. We had mammals during the dinosaurs, but they were tiny, little smaller than mice. They lived underground, not very abundant. They have been around for a, a while. The massive amount were dinosaurs, the two types of dinosaurs. Now, Look at what happens here. Here is the 65 million year period. The dinosaurs go flat. And what happens to the mammals? And what happens to these other groups here, birds and crocodiles, that are related to these dinosaurs that were small? You have this humongous explosion in diversity. And the idea is that when the dinosaurs went extinct, there were so many niches available, so much open opportunities, that basically you were able to colonize many different environments. And when you can colonize different environments, different conditions, speciation just flourishes. Now, how did the mammals survive? Or all these little birds survive this major event? Well, remember decreasing light. If you are a tiny mouse, how much food do you need? If you are a tiny mouse, you need a couple of seeds will keep you alive for a day or longer. So remember, these guys lived underground, needed very little food, and were able to make it through this terrible time. Same thing with these guys. The dinosaurs, humongous bodies, they needed too much energy and was not available anymore. So bad for some, good for some other ones. So that rounds up the story. And here we have, get back to all our kingdoms, bacteria, archaebacteria, protista, fungi, plants and animals. This is what we have today. And all of them grouped into three domains based on their molecular evidence. Now, just to give you a taste of this, I want to show you this quick video here. It's live in 60 seconds. Just give me a minute to set it up. Live in 60 seconds. You can click on this link if you're at home. Um, there are some typos I should warn you, but besides the typos... Outgassing of molecules. Keep an eye on the time and in the clock. Formation of ocean rocks. Prokaryotic cell photosynthesis. Right here. Photosynthesis by blue green algae. We are half the way through the life of Earth. Eukaryotic cell organisms. Two, mil two billion years ago. Fifteen seconds left. Ten seconds. Seven. Five seconds. I hope this helps.